we're working as a basis from the Twilight Struggle rulebook. Well, guess what rulebook doesn't have the final victory point for the <laughs> China card? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's no bizarre that a 15-year-old game still should have another piece of errata that no one has, no one has ever pointed this out to me ever. Um, so I don't know. It, it was it was a much more annoying process than I thought it would be. Cardboard Creations, where we discuss the process, techniques, and inspiration for designing board games. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm super excited to be here today with Jason Matthews to find out how Twilight Struggle Red Sea Conflict in the Horn of Africa was created. But first, let's jump into a brief overview of how Twilight Struggle Red Sea works. Twilight Struggle Red Sea Conflict in the Horn of Africa is a two-player standalone card-driven game that builds on the award-winning Twilight Struggle, simulating the sudden escalation of the Horn of Africa in 1974 from a stable diplomatic backwater to a central front in the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Twilight Struggle Red Sea is part of GMT's Lunchtime series and packs deep decision making into a shorter time frame and is an excellent way to introduce new players to the Twilight Struggle system. Over the course of two turns through tense card play, players will alternate triggering events and performing operations to manipulate their country's influence in Africa and the Middle East while competing in the space race and trying to prevent a nuclear war. When scoring cards are played, Players can score victory points for presence, domination, or control of a region based on their influence in the countries within the region being scored. At the end of the late war turn, whoever has the most victory points wins the game. However, there are a few ways to achieve an automatic victory and end the game sooner. Hey Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, Candace. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. So. You know, let me tell you, I am a big fan of Twilight Struggle and, and pretty much every game that I've played that was inspired by it, you know, like I, I'm just a fan of like card driven games that have that like push and pull tension to them. But I was so excited when GMT announced that they were going to have this new version of Twilight Struggle in their lunchtime series. I was like, ooh, I cannot wait for that. As much as I love Twilight Struggle, I can't get it to the table enough so i just i just haven't played it enough i haven't been able to get it to the table uh, mainly because it takes a long time to play um it does. so yeah so it's awesome now to have this new version that you know captures the the tension and the core essence and mechanisms of twilight struggle but it can be played in an hour like psh. So I'm 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 really really excited that this this game exists. So what what initially inspired you to create Twilight Struggle Red Sea? There were a couple of things um, that inspired it, and one of them was I had known that we had neglected to cover this particular political episode in Twilight Struggle, and I. Uh, during various attempts to, you know, add cards for expansions or whatever, I'd come up with a Red Sea scoring card. And um, at the same time, there seemed to be an appetite in the community of players for, for expansions because there are, GMT gets all of the suggested expansion cards and, you know, cool. people are always cool. coming up with variants that they want GMT to print. And so I was like, well, there are a bunch of things that I think would be nice to have for Twilight Struggle. Why don't I, instead of just making a variant card that deals with um, the Horn of Africa, let me just make a little game out of it. And I, th I have thought for a long time, you know, a lot of people buy Twilight Struggle, a lot of Euro game players buy Twilight Struggle because of its reputation but there's no great way to on-ramp them into the game. And they're intimidated by the length right. and they're intimidated because they, you know, they think it's a war game. Um, and so they, there are all of these like reasons why 
people buy copies, but then they sit on shelves or they get traded away eventually. Sure, sure. And so I kind of wanted to fix that problem. And we designed Twilight Struggle Red Sea specifically to help introduce the full game to players. The way the map is laid out, you know, uh, the kind of explanatory charts that would normally be freestanding are actually on the board. So you can sit there and explain uh, to new players. And I think it's also, in addition to people who have never played, it's a great way for someone who has played but is trying to explain the game to a new player how to bring them into the experience. And all of that, then you also just, you get this uh, capacity to have something like a Twilight Struggle experience, literally in a lunchtime kind of package. You can you can get a whole game done. After you play it a few times, you can get it done in 35 to 45 minutes, no problem. So awesome. When and how did you transform that initial idea and inspiration to like make this new version of Twilight Struggle? How did you get it to a playable prototype? It was kind of a COVID project. So um, I had more free time than I normally would lying around. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing game design anyway, even when, <laughs> even if COVID's not occurred. There's a, a gentleman who's credited in the rules as one of the developers. His name is Bruce Wigdor, and he uh, runs a site. He's like a, a skilled programmer, and he can put together uh, game prototypes that you can play that implement the rules oh, uh, really cool. quickly. And the first implementation and play testing occurred there. Oh, uh, wow. And then somebody else did a tabletopia version. Anyway, they're now, thank heavens, uh, because COVID would have made this much more difficult. Thank heavens there are so many online methods for testing prototypes these days. So this game got a ton of testing um, compared to what I had been able to do before. Certainly when Twilight Struggle came out and we were sending out paper copies to people and hoping they'd put them together and maybe they'd send me an email six weeks later about their experience. And that was kind of how things went. Sure. Sure. So did, did you, did you have your, um, your, your prototype, was it like digital the whole time or at some point did you make a physical copy of it and like how did how do you go about like making physical prototypes too it is the thing i hate most about game design like i don't enjoy it and it feels like arts and crafts class and i didn't <laughs> really love that and i don't really love this unlike my normal circumstance the i did make physical uh, a couple of physical copies of it maybe four altogether but um by the time I made physical copies, they were really just to show the game because I had, it was more or less done. But, you know, you can't show uh, an online game at a board game convention. So I had a few copies anyway. <laughs> cool. And how how was it like, did you find compared to, um, you know, your experience working on the original um, Twilight Struggle, did you find that this was just like it kind of came together development wise? I guess where were some of the challenges? Was it like coming up with new event cards or? N no, the the new event cards was kind of fun. And a lot of the events in this game hearken to events in Twilight Struggle again, because we're trying to like teach some of the concepts in the main game here. So when you get to Twilight Struggle, you recognize uh, none of the cards are precisely the same, but some of them are related. Sure. Um, but the main problem with this game, particularly um, in playtesting, that was not quite true in Twilight Struggle, because Twilight Struggle is a long game with a lot of turns. Um, little effects don't show up as dramatically in, in playtesting. I mean, if there's a problem, it actually takes us a lot of playtests to figure out there is a problem because there's such a long arc. Right. In this game, when you made one little change because the area is so tight and the number of cards played is so few, it had all these cascading effects. So, oh, I changed this card. Oh, now I need to change three other cards. It was a lot of that kind of problem <laughs> because it's this 
uh, knife fight in a phone booth uh, feel. Right, right, right. At what point did you start documenting rules uh, for Twilight Shuggle Red Sea? And how, you know, how did that process change from original Twilight Struggle to Twilight Struggle Red Sea? I did something that Volko suggested, actually, and I was like, I kind of like that idea and I'm going to try it. Um, he he said that m most designers start with a player aid last. It's like the thing that they complete after the rule book writing is done. It's like the throwaway thing you do at the end of the process. And he was like, I, th I think that's a mistake. I think game designers should start with the player aid first. Um, and then if, if you can explain your game from the player aid, you know, you've like hit onto something. Yeah, so yeah. I, I went down that path myself uh, with this game and it was already since the Twilight Struggle rules existed, you know, it, it shorthand was always probably the way to go. That said, um, editing. <laughs> I'll just give you one example. There's one problem in the Twilight Struggle Red Sea rulebook. And that problem is um, there is something like the China card. Uh, it's Romanian. Uh, it, it's a card about Romania now. And um, in the final scoring rules, even though on the card it says, if you hold this at the end of the game, you get a victory point. In the final scoring rules, that that uh, card is not mentioned or that victory point is not mentioned. Uh, we were scratching our head, like, how did this escape us all this time? Um, and we're working as a basis from the Twilight Struggle rulebook. Well, Guess what rulebook doesn't have the final victory point for the China card? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's no bizarre that a 15-year-old game still should have another piece of errata that no one has no one has ever pointed this out to me ever. Um, so I don't know. It, it was it was a much more annoying process than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. So what, what would you say was the biggest challenge that you faced when you were designing or developing Twilight Struggle Red Sea? Um, the biggest challenge I would say um, was making it have the same feel of tension in a short amount of time. Like, how do you uh, how do you make every card count and how do you get that feel that, oh, I don't have enough to do everything I want, or how do you keep play from being predictable on a on a 10 or 11 space map? Um, and I'm very, very proud of the way the game plays in the sense that you can play the game 10 times and you won't have the same experience on any 10 of those games. Um, it just plays out very differently, in part because of the way the dynamic within the deck um, there are more more cards than you will play in this game than you will play in this game. So it it um, it, it keeps it more of a guessing game than normally a two turn game would be. Right, right. That's that's awesome. Um, so I guess did you? I always piggyback this question, but did you experience any aha moments from working on this version? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I think there were two things that were important realizations. Um, this game has something, we introduced a new concept called um, Flashpoint Countries, and it represents how important that uh, Somalia and Ethiopia are in the history of this game, in this context. And at the same time, they're not battleground countries like Twilight Struggle, because in the grand scheme of things, they only matter in in the Cold War for about five or six years. Addressing that with that mechanism really helped the simulation tell the story that we wanted it to tell. And I couldn't get there with just the structure and Twilight Struggle. But the other aha moment that isn't necessarily used in this game, but will be used in some subsequent games of this ilk, uh, I was like, oh, we really could change all of these countries in a bunch of little ways, and it would make the game more interesting. Uh, we can create all sorts of subsets of different kinds of um, Twilight Struggle spaces 
and that could be super um, dynamic and add some new life to the game for whatever future iterations we do. Cool. So as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm wondering, you know, Twilight Struggle, you, the original Twilight Struggle, you co-designed with Anunda Gupta. And then this one, you're kind of, you worked on, on your own. Can you talk a little bit about just like how that whole experience differed? Like when you were like co-designing versus now more solo designing? I know you work with developers and everything, but just kind of yeah, curious. Of course. I mean, no game design is really solo. Everything is a collaborative undertaking, as you know. This is actually the first game I've ever published just by myself. I've always had a co-designer. And the reason, one of the reasons that I tend to prefer it is I like having somebody else keep me accountable for timelines and that sort of thing. Because I have my I have a whole nother life. This isn't really my job, et cetera, et cetera. So I so having to produce someone for some or something for someone else makes it more likely to happen. Whereas if it's just me, I'm like, well, I can wait tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Sure. Yeah. Now in this case, I was here alone and COVID was happening. And so there it it made it for a lot of reasons, just easier to handle on my own. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I was just sitting here like kind of wondering how that like experience differed. And I didn't even realize that this is the first game you've published that is just Jason Matthews. <laughs> Ananda was kind enough to look over the cards and, you know, we're, we're friends. And so he, he, um, he put in some free labor, but. Awesome. Awesome. How are the art and graphic design decisions made uh, for Twilight Struggle Red Sea? Because uh, let me, you kind of touched on it a little earlier, but I think it's incredible that it has so much helpful information on the board for you know making it accessible. So you you between having a player aid and what's printed on the board, there's so much reference material and it's presented really really nicely. So it's it just helps you again keeps you at your head out of the rule book and into the game. So how are some of those de uh, decisions made? I mean, f first and foremost, um, Terry Leeds, who is the lead graphic designer for this, is a fantastic guy to work with. Could not be, if, is another one of these artists who when I say, well, this is kind of what I'm looking for, he does it and does it better than I imagine. So that, <laughs> awesome. that's just like a good human being to be working with at all times. But in in the case, particularly of this kind of um, accessibility and uh, user interface, if you want to call it for this particular game, the nice thing was so many talented people have contributed um, their own ideas for what a better player aid for Twilight Struggle would look like. And all of the, you know, there are a ton of these kinds of reference materials online and uh, honestly, I went through, picked out what I thought were the best ideas and said, hey, Terry, we need something like this. And I want it on both sides of the board and la, 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 la. And he did this incredible thing. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I, I love that, like hearing when the kind of outside gaming community influences <laughs> some cool things I mean, that designers are working on. For sure. And I, I try to pay attention what pe to what people are doing. And there's, um, I think there'll be a 25th anniversary edition for Twilight Struggle. And I, there have been some amazing graphical um, reinterpretations of Twilight Struggle. And I think we'll do something along those lines for the 25th anniversary edition. But uh, as you, you would note, there are a little flourishes to let people know this is a Twilight Struggle Red Sea card, like it has the Ethiopian flag bands and that sort of thing. So you can tell at a glance, but the graphic style is very much the same as Twilight Struggle because we want those cards to integrate. So whatever we do graphically in the future will also integrate with itself. Awesome. Thinking back to 2005 or before Twilight Struggle came out, how did you guys, do you remember, how did you guys come up with the name Twilight Struggle? It was neither of us. It was a very good friend of ours, Sean Metcalf. He was a member of our uh, gaming group. And um, 
we'd thrown around a bunch of things. I I had always been very fond of Iron Curtain, even though that's kind of like a an east just an eastern reference. And it was it was Sean who was like, "Hey, what about the Twilight Struggle from Kennedy's inaugural?" And we were like, "Oh yeah, that's perfect." So. <laughs> Yeah, I usually like to find out how um, a game title came up, but, you know, Twilight Struggle, Red Sea, um, Conflict in the Horn of Africa, just, it, it kind of makes sense. So that's why I was yeah. curious to know how, like, Twilight Struggle popped up. Because uh, I exactly. didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. When did you know the game was finished and, you know, ready to be produced? I'm, as, I'm I think that was a P500. Uh, it was, yeah. yeah. So when when did when did you and you know the team at GMT say, hey, we're ready to pump this out there and see, I, see if there's it, it takes me a while to feel comfortable with all the cards. And um I think when I get uh CDG to the point where every card feels like I want to use it, but it's a dilemma. I, maybe I need the ops, but I really would like this event. Once you get to that point, then you're good. Like, okay, you've got to make sure play balance still works. Right. So that's just like an iteration of, you know, as many games as you can get in. But if you can just get to this, um, every card matters, then uh, to me, then you're 90% there. Yeah, and that will roll right into my next question. Do you have any advice um for someone out there who's trying to design a card driven historical strategy game i mean you've done so many so i feel like you're the perfect person to ask this <laughs> um i think i mean i have my methodology and so I, I don't know that it would work for everybody because people conceptualize differently but what i try to do i start with some research because that's I don't know how to do it without that, but I, I, anyway, the Euro guys go about this an entirely different way, but I, for me, so I have to read a book and I don't, I, I think there's a danger, a weird danger in becoming a subject matter expert because I play games from people, uh, war game designers who are subject matter, ex, uh, subject, subject matter experts, and they get so uh, focused on exceptions and detail that you you lose the overarching narrative in the design because what they want to worry about is these little particularities but in the grand scheme of conveying a message and a story by a game those particularities um, distort the story right because it, they're exceptions so I tried to pick the book whatever the book is like the most famous book on the subject. And I start there. And um, for the last several games, as I'm reading, I start compiling a list of potential events. Like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that could make a good card. And then I'll have too many of those when I'm done. <laughs> like <laughs> 200 ideas or something. And I have to start culling. Uh, and, then, um, and then I work up a map, but uh, another part of my process has traditionally been that at the outset, I define the parameters, like how many cards is it gonna be? How big is the map gonna be? How long are we gonna play? And I work from those parameters to, okay, well, if we're only gonna play for an hour, we can only have this many cards and la 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 la. And so it, those parameters help define what I'm gonna do. Um, and then after that, as soon as I possibly can, I'll make a mock-up of, of a map and start playing around because I don't think anything is a good substitute for having the opportunity to actually roll dice or play cards or get a sense of where this is going. That's very cool. Another thing that I'm finding special, and I think other people will too, about Twilight Struggle Red Sea is that there's a solo mode. Um, so yeah, solo solo modes are very important in a lot of like war games and historical games. How did that development work in terms of turning 
Twilight struggle into a solo game? <laughs> well, it's uh, one of the, uh, another advantage of having a smaller map with the with fewer cards and uh, fewer turns is that it makes um, the kind of bot that Jason Carr developed possible to apply to Twilight Struggle. Like if you were to do the full game, you have to have a, a whole nother construction of bot because no one can go down 70 charts to be like, no, 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 no. I mean, it would take forever. Uh, besides there's an app, so why do that? Uh, so, um, but in Twilight Struggle, it works extraordinarily well, and it is a very good way to learn the game. If Some people just are solo gamers, so that's just a part of the wargaming hobby. And if if you want to play that way, you know, we've, we've uh, given you a mechanism. And, and since it wasn't available for Twilight Struggle, um, you know, it's a way to get a taste of Twilight Struggle also by solo play uh, without, you know, playing both hands or whatever. Um, so I think, uh, it is, you know, we try to provide a lot of value in the box, right? You get, it's a teaching game. It's a short lunchtime game. You have a solo bot. If you want to try that, you can incorporate the cards from this game into twilight struggle and from twilight struggle into this game. And we gave you customized dice. So that's a, that's a lot for one box. Yeah. <laughs> that's more productive than I usually am for sure. <laughs> So cool. Uh, well, Jason, thank you so much for joining me today on Cardboard Creations. It's really, really cool to hear the backstory for, you know, a little bit of Twilight Struggle and Twilight Struggle Red Sea. Um, I know you mentioned there's a 25th anniversary version of Twilight Struggle that we can look forward to in a couple years. Uh, yeah, a couple years, right? Yeah. Well, soon, soon enough. It'll it'll be here before you know it. But is there right, anything? It does, yeah, for sure. <laughs> is there anything else you're working on that you'd like to mention? So, uh, Jason Carr and I are doing another one of these kinds of games that will be. If this was designed to uh, be an introduction for Twilight Struggle players, the game that we're working on is going to be for experienced Twilight Struggle players and provide them with a deeper more complicated challenge not longer but just more things to consider Ooh. so uh I, that'll be that's fun to work on we're doing that now uh i have a bunch of other projects um but i've i've been talking about one that i just need to finish um which is a card driven game on aaron burr and the treason trial surrounding his exploits after uh, he shot alexander hamilton I have heard about this. I'm excited about that. Yeah, they, Al Berry designed something called High Treason, which is a, it's a fantastic little CDG on um, Louis Rial, who led a rebellion in Canada. And, um, and so it was the first time I'd ever seen um, a CDG applied to a courtroom setting. And that sort of... In, now the Canadian Canadian law works differently, so you can't just like port his system into some other trial. Um, it inspired me anyway to kind of work on this because this is one of our most famous treason trials ourselves. Awesome, awesome! I'm looking forward to that, Jason. <laughs> well, it's been fantastic talking with you, Candace, and yeah, uh, I'm jealous that you're in LA, my hometown, and I'm in the freezing cold. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it hasn't been super warm here, but I think we're about to hit that, you know, getting back yeah. into the 70s. And uh, I'm, I'm originally from Philly, but I'm still a wuss. Anytime it goes below 70, I'm like, oh, it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, awesome, awesome to talk to you as always. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all for watching Cardboard Creations. Hopefully it's been as inspiring and fascinating for you as it has been for me. And remember... The only way to get something done is to start doing it. Mm -hmm.